All right, let's do this. Hey everybody, how you doing? Hope you're good. Uh, welcome back, good to see you figuratively here on YouTube. Uh, it is September slash October of 2021, and that means we're in to a new year here of public forum debate on Hale State debate with a pretty good topic resolved. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization should substantially increase its defense commitments to the Baltic states. Uh, if you are new to the channel, Hale State Debate is a project of the Mississippi State University debate team. My name is Brett Harvey. I'm the coach. We often have members of the team on the videos with us, uh, but I am flying solo on these early videos uh, which is part of the reason why this one was a little bit late. So thanks for your patience. Apologies on that because it was just me. Uh, but the basic idea of the channel is we want to expand access to debate to pretty much anybody who wants to do it. So we combine kind of knowledge of like debate theory and how the debate circuit works with just sort of real world arguments that can kind of stand up to the sort of scrutiny you'd see again in the real world. Uh, if it is useful to you, and we hope it is, maybe like, maybe subscribe, maybe tell a friend. And as always, the sources we cite and the timestamps to all the sections will be in the description below. Uh, and lastly, oh right, if you want to follow us on Twitter to kind of get our musings and kind of snarky remarks about debate and life in general, we are at Hail State Debate. So let's jump right into it because boy do we have a lot to cover. The core of this resolution is really about the ongoing clash between NATO countries on the one hand, led by the U.S., and Russia on the other, over which of the two spheres of influence is going to be predominant in Eastern Europe, and more specifically in the former Soviet republics, uh, the countries that before 1991 made up the USSR, and even more specifically than that, in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, aka the Baltic states, because they are on the Baltic Sea. Uh, Russia was dramatically weakened as a global superpower by the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union that it once controlled. Before then, the world basically kind of had this bipolar balance of power between the U.S. and the Soviet Union or the USSR. That's why NATO was formed in the first place, right? But after 1991, Russia arguably ceased to be a superpower entirely. It's far behind the United States. It's far behind China. And like a lot of former powers who have seen themselves weakened, it has turned to a strongman leader in the form of Vladimir Putin, who wants to reassert Russian dominance and influence in Eastern Europe and more broadly. There are plenty of examples of Putin's attempts to do that, to sort of aggressively reassert dominance. You can see that in the invasion of Georgia, the, 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 the nation of Georgia in 2008, and of the Crimean region of Ukraine in 2008. 2014, both of which were fairly successful invasions, uh, with Russia annexing Crimea and establishing puppet governments in two regions of Georgia. But the Baltic states, like Ukraine and Georgia, are also former Soviet republics. But the difference is that the Baltics have always resisted the idea of Russian dominance, even when they were under the control of the USSR. Back in the 90s, as soon as they could signal their alliance with the West, they did. As soon as they could join NATO and the European Union, they did. They've implemented Western-style democratic and market reforms and have generally outpaced other countries in the region in growth. In other words, unlike many of their neighbors in the region, they are solidly on Team NATO and Team EU, and they solidly oppose Russia. So this resolution is really about whether Russia might be preparing to attack or otherwise try to threaten or undermine the Baltic states in some way, either to potentially maybe reclaim them as part of Russia, or perhaps more likely just to destabilize them and destabilize NATO by showing its members that the alliance won't protect them. Now, if Russia is prone to do something like that, right, it may be that a NATO defensive buildup in the Baltics is the only way. It's necessary to show them that this is pointless and to avoid a war. But on the other hand, uh, if those assumptions are wrong, if Russia currently has no real intention of uh, being aggressive, it could be that ramping up the defensive presence or just the rhetoric could actually cause Russia to attack, whereas they otherwise would have left the Baltics alone. And we're going to talk a lot more about historical background in just a minute because it's super important. But very, very broadly, what this resolution kind of does is put both teams in the middle of like a strategic game of chess between Russia and the U.S.-led NATO alliance and asks them to persuade the judge of what NATO's next move should be. Which leads nicely to my first preliminary point, which is that framing the decision for the judge in uh, debate rounds on this topic is very important, right? This is not an easily quantifiable resolution like housing subsidies or Medicare for all. PF judges and teams who come to expect these sort of clear-cut numerical or statistical answers are going to be disappointed and frustrated here because that's just not how 
uh, international military strategy works. And if teams are demanding these exact quantifications or if they pretend they can provide them, you really do need to push back on that. Instead of pretending that there is some ironclad way to predict what Russia or other powers might do, you really need to just level with the judge and say, look, again, we're just playing a game of chess here. Nobody knows with certainty what Russia is going to do, right? what their next move will be. Nobody can say for sure what their general strategy is. But what we can do is look to what Russia has done in the past, what they're doing right now, and what experts say about which strategy, a build-up or no build-up, is going to be the best way to keep them contained. And at the end of the day, you as the judge have to make your best guess on what will admittedly be imperfect information as to what the next move in the game should be for NATO, right? And we're going to give you our best estimate and, you know, hopefully you vote for us, right? I think that kind of intellectually honest framing will go a long way with a lot of judges who I think will intuitively be able to tell that these sort of false precision blippy arguments that pretend to be able to predict the future that no expert can predict are just not realistic, right? On a similar note, I think it's also a resolution where the credibility of sources matters, right? If you can't just point to numbers, you mainly then have to point to opinions and predictions from experts. So qualifications as well as biases really matter. You know, very good teams frequently make notes or write blocks to help them defend their sources or attack sources used on the other side, and that certainly seems to be important here. And lastly, it's just a topic where knowing what you're talking about is really going to matter. If you, you know, can't lean on a killer statistic, you're going to have to make logical arguments about incentives. You're going to have to know a lot of details about the history of the Baltics, about Russian aggression, about current military deployments. You're just going to have to be able to talk about those things extemporaneously and draw connections and expose contradictions and use sound logic you know, and sound like you know what you're talking about, right? And I think that ability to draw analogies and show that you know what you're talking about will be really essential. So with that, we're going to move on to the substance of the video. First, we will do some basic definitions, then a good bit of historical background, and then some framing issues, then pro and then con. Okay, so let's do some definitions, background, and framing. Uh, we're going to start with the definitions before we move into the historical background just so we have like a basic shared vocabulary of like the major actors and major issues before we like hit play and start talking about how they've been interacting. Uh, I know that we don't read a lot of definitions in PF rounds, so really all this is for is to sort of get us on the same page, although there could be some potential issues like topicality. I don't think we're going to be fighting, for example, over what NATO means. I really don't think we're going to be fighting over what the Baltic states are, but, you know, there could be some disagreement about what constitutes like a defense commitment, so we will talk a little bit about that. So first, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is a military alliance involving 30 European and North American countries established in 1949 as a bulwark mainly against the Russian-led uh, USSR. Uh, the, the major provision you need to know about is Article 5, the Mutual Defense Agreement. This may be the most important provision in the treaty. It simply says that an attack on any member is treated as an attack on all. This is the core of what NATO is. It's not like an economic union like the WTO. It's not like a general debating society like the UN. It is a mutual defense pact. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have been members since 2004. We'll talk about them in just a minute. But since 2004, the status quo involves a pretty major defense commitment, right? NATO is already saying, just by virtue of accepting uh, the Baltic states as members, that if you attack any of them, all NATO members will treat that as an attack on them, presumably triggering, triggering conflict or war, right? And the prospect of going to war with 30 countries, including the nuclear powers like the U.S. and the U.K., is a pretty sobering prospect, even for someone like Vladimir Putin in Russia. So one big question is just how much more commitment does NATO really need to make here, right? Why should we expect there to be any net difference from the commitment we've already made, which is we will go to war with you, which is pretty sobering, and whatever else we do beyond that, right? What is the relevant threshold that we're getting over and why will it make a difference, right? The next term is Baltic states. And we, as we discussed earlier, these are Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, bordering the Baltic Sea on one side and Russia on the other. Uh, this is very consistent throughout the literature that the term uh, Baltic states refers to these three and only these three. So you really shouldn't see much debate about which countries we're talking about, if any. Uh, so, for example, like Belarus, right, is also in the region, but it's not on the Baltic. It's not in NATO. It's closely aligned with Russia. So it's clearly not one of the Baltic states. 
Uh, you, you can learn more about this in a, a dozen different articles, Wikipedia, other videos on the topic. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. But just in terms of background on what the Baltic states look like as countries, first, their populations are very small. Estonia is at 1.3 million, Latvia at 1.9 million, Lithuania at 2.7 million, leaves each one with a smaller population than my home state of Mississippi. Uh, each country has its own ethnic identity of Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians that make up roughly at least, if not more than two thirds of their respective populations. But each has a significant ethnic Russian population, particularly in Latvia and Estonia, where ethnic Russians make up uh, at least 25% of the population, right? Now, militarily, these countries cannot approach matching Russia's budget and thus rely on NATO and Western alliances for defense. There's a good summary of the differences between Russia and the Baltic states in the Small Wars Journal in 2017. And as you can see here, in the Western Military District, which is the Russian area uh, essentially bordering the Baltics, you can see the massive numbers of hundreds of thousands of troops, artillery, tanks, warplanes. They grossly outclass anything you see in the Baltics. Uh, who have a collective total of 22,000 troops, a little bit of artillery, but no tanks or warplanes. So as we'll talk about later on the pro, there is a strong general consensus that in any armed conflict between the two, Russia would very easily roll over uh, the, the Baltic states in a very short period of time, even with the small number of NATO troops that are currently stationed there. So they clearly need help from NATO to ensure their national defense, which brings us to the next term, defense commitments. Now, this is a slightly vague choice of terminology, right? Uh, one of the, the few things I don't like about the resolution, the term defense commitments is not like some term of art with a specific legal meaning. Doesn't appear in the North Atlantic Treaty, doesn't appear in any NATO rules, doesn't come from any international law. Right? So there could be some disputes in certain rounds over what exactly this term means. Interestingly, many of the references that you find when you search the term NATO defense commitments actually refer to the commitments that individual NATO members make to maintain their own militaries and their own capacity to defend themselves, right? That's where the term comes up very frequently. Article three of the North Atlantic Treaty, which is NATO's charter, specifically says that the member states will maintain and develop their individual and collective capacity to resist armed attack. In 2006, NATO members agreed to like give some force to this provision by agreeing to spend at least 2% of their respective GDPs on defense. Uh, now, I don't think that that use of the term defense commitments can be what we mean here, though, right? Because again, this is a commitment by country X to NATO. And what we're talking about here is clearly some commitment by NATO to the Baltic states, right? Luckily, there are other examples of the term defense commitments being used in the literature, right? The most basic is that defense commitments seems to refer to just the general agreement that we talked about earlier under Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty to treat an attack on one as an attack on all. Right. So, for example, just one example from Beninjik in 2019, he says, while viewed largely as a political mechanism, Article 4 consultations have been seen as a step toward invoking collective defense commitments under Article 5. So under that interpretation, it sounds like defense commitments can just refer to the general agreement under Article 5 of NATO to protect other members. Now, one problem with that, though, is the fact that that promise has already been made. Right. Article 5, you know, the promise exists in NATO's charter. As soon as you join, you have the benefit of it. I think it's a common sense matter, and I don't have a source on this. The only real way to interpret it is that defense commitments just refers to the practical steps that NATO takes to actually make good on that promise, right? To defend these countries, you have to station troops in them. You have to station military uh, units, right? Artillery, things like that in these countries. And so when you do that, right, when you whether they've been attacked or not, even though they even before they're attacked, right? When you position troops there, you are making good on your defense commitments, right? And I think just a common sense interpretation is that when NATO takes steps to put measures in place, whether it's troops, whether it's you know establishing a permanent headquarters, whether it is making a strongly worded statement, whatever it is, when NATO takes those steps, it is at least in theory making good on its defense commitments, right? That's that's the best I can do in finding a useful definition. There are other specific definitions. For example, there's an article from John Curran in 2021 about NATO's cyber defense commitments, which were discussed at the NATO summit in 2021. So if people wanted to try to take a more esoteric uh, approach to the topic and talk, for example, specifically 
specifically about cyber defense, I suppose you could do that. I don't think that is what the framers of the resolution had in mind. I don't think that's the primary threat that Russia poses. Uh, so you could have some topicality fights there, but there is a possibility, and we'll link to that article. Uh, substantially increase is an interesting term. Substantially is a common term in policy debate resolutions, and it's basically meant to give the con or the negative a topicality objection, right? If the pro tries to run a very small, limited, narrow, like esoteric case, right? You know, so if you look up some arcane news story and say that like there's a NATO post in Estonia that you know doesn't have enough security guards, so they need to hire six more. I mean, that's that's not going to be enough to be substantial. But what is substantial? Well, it's meant to be very debatable, right? It's something that we we learn to fight about in rounds. What is big enough to be fair, right? What is big enough to be educational? Now, in public forum, it's made more complex by the fact that the NSDA rules expressly forbid the teams from running plans and counter plans. It's right there in the rules, right? And as we've said before. Four, how rigorously this rule is enforced by the judges, how likely your opponent is to fight you over it. It's all kind of dependent on like where you're debating, who your judge is, who your opponent is, right? This is especially true since under PF rules, while you can't use a plan, you can offer a quote, generalized practical solution, whatever that means, right? And, and this is another one of the downsides of the resolution, which is that when you're talking about deploying multinational military forces, or at least some action in support of national defense on the global stage, Stage, right? The devil is in the details. It really is all about how you do it, right? And adding a policy debate term like substantially only amplifies that. So there are dozens of different specific proposals and ideas in the literature about how NATO might seek to better defend the Baltic states. They include things like just stationing more NATO troops there, stationing them on a permanent basis as opposed to what is currently a rotating basis, uh, putting uh, U.S. troops specifically into the Baltics so that any invasion would trigger war with the U.S., uh, establishing a permanent regional headquarters, setting up a missile defense system, taking some action on cyber defense, or maybe just making a really pointed direct statement to Russia that if you enter the Baltics, we will go to war with you. So there is this massive spectrum, right, from putting like tens of thousands of U.S. troops right on the border with Russia all the way down to like a sternly worded letter or statement, right? How do you debate about the costs and benefits and the risks of those if you can't specify what you're talking about? And I think there's two basic options, right? One is you just pick one and you argue, this is not a plan, it's a generalized practical solution and you just kind of go to the mat on that. You'd be ready to defend you know, what the NSDA rule says and that this is the only practical way for us to debate this. We have to be able to articulate something specific, right? And you just argue for that. The second option is to say instead that the pro is just advocating for a general principle of increasing NATO defense in the Baltic states. We are not allowed by rule to pick any single plan, right? So we are not going to claim any like super specific benefits from any particular plan. We're just going to claim the high level benefits of deterring like Russian aggression, preventing nuclear war and things like that, right? You can make arguments about why this is the right interpretation. First of all, it is arguably what the rules require. Secondly. It is kind of the style that PF was created to encourage, right? If you want specific plans, there's an event for that. It's called policy debate. So this general approach would probably be my preference. I would be very comfortable telling the judge, look, PF debate is about a general clash between two positions. And in this debate, it's about a, a very real world clash, right? Do we need to step up our defense of the Baltics to deter Russia? Or do we need to like back off or maintain the status quo to avoid provoking them? That is what the real world debate is about. PF is supposed to reflect the real world. It's the most educational, fair way to do this. So let's do that, right? So that is sort of a basic framing question along with definitions. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the factual background because again, this is a topic where some depth of knowledge and, and, and really knowing what you're talking about is essential. So it would take multiple videos to even begin to address the long, complicated history of the Baltic states, which empires have controlled them, where their allegiances have been. Suffice it to say, they're in a region of the world that has always been stuck between larger, more powerful empires like Russia and Germany. So they've been pulled back and forth in wars and conquests from one empire to another, in some cases to independence. But anyway, long story short, after World War II, the Baltic states, like much of Eastern Europe, found themselves annexed into the Soviet Union, which was a collection of puppet so-called republics that were controlled by the communist government of Russia. 
Uh, unlike some other countries, the Baltic states really hated this arrangement, and they were about as resistant to Soviet Russian rule as it was possible to be. They were not predominantly ethnically Russian. Uh, they saw themselves as basically Western, and they did not particularly care for communism. So they engaged in various uprisings and guerrilla warfare against the Soviets uh, throughout the late 20th century. Because of their continuing resistance and other factors, the U.S. never recognized the USSR's claim to Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia, and supported the restoration of their independence after the USSR collapsed in 1991. Now, by the mid-1990s, all three of the Baltics had become formally independent nation-states with democratic constitutions. The United States had implemented the U.S. Baltic Charter in 1998, which basically was a public statement of mutual support. In other words, hey, these guys are our friends, don't mess with them, right? The Baltic states joined NATO in 2004, as well as joining the EU in the same year, and have remained reliable members, contributing, at least more recently, contributing the recommended 2% of their budgets to defense spending. They also kind of provide like a model of more like Western-style liberal democracy, free trade, general support for the NATO transatlantic alliance. Uh, as well as opposition to Russian influence uh, in Eastern Europe. In other words, the Baltics have long been pro-West and pro-NATO. They are not on the fence. They are solidly on team NATO. And they have always resented Russian interference. Their decision to embrace democracy and free trade with the West has allowed them to grow economically faster than their neighbors, but they still remain obviously comparatively tiny countries, as we talked about earlier, who realistically could not oppose uh, any serious Russian aggression. Now, the importance of the Baltic states as these sort of like pro-Western, pro-NATO bulwarks has increased since Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 and annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in 2014. Experts generally agree that Russia wants to reassert its status as a global power by bringing the old Soviet republics back under its control, or at least under its influence, right? Uh, but there's a significant debate about whether this applies to the Baltic states. Some think that Russia views them as being basically so far gone, like right, so pro-NATO, that they're basically a lost cause and not worth the risk, unlike other former Soviet satellites. But these countries are strategically important given their position on the Baltic Sea. They're also important because they are the eastern flank of the NATO alliance, sharing a border with Russia. So it might be that Russia poses a risk in the Baltics even if it knows it could never seize control over them for the long term. For example, if you believe that Russia wants to destabilize NATO, and by the way, it does, right? If Russia wants to do that just for the sake of destabilizing it, the Baltics might be the logical place to try to do that, to like invade or at least just harass weak NATO members right on its border just to show other NATO members that they cannot rely on the alliance. For these reasons, in recent years, NATO and its member countries have reasserted their support for the Baltic states. At the 2016 NATO summit in Warsaw, NATO introduced the Enhanced Forward Presence, or EFP units, to all three Baltic states as well as to Poland. What does this Enhanced Forward Presence entail? Well, it looks like this. And as you can see, uh, NATO as of April 2021 has member troops deployed in all three Baltic states as well as in Poland, which is just to the south, and is important because it sits on the opposite side of this little sliver of territory in the middle here, which is actually a non-contiguous section of Russia. That's Russian territory. This is the area around Kaliningrad, which is a strategic Russian port city that Russia held on to after the collapse of the USSR. But in practical terms, what does all of this mean? Well, it means that the Baltic states themselves have significantly less than 30,000 active duty military between them, augmented by probably something like three or 4,000 NATO troops that rotate in and out of the Baltics, again, on a rotating basis, along with about 5,000 U.S. troops, including a heavy armor division with 250 tanks stationed just to the south in Poland. Both the Baltics themselves and the U.S. have increased their defense commitments in the region just this year, but frankly, there's an argument that these increases in the status quo are really at a level that it's mainly symbolic in comparison to what it would require to stop a Russian advance. So, for example... In December 2020, the U.S. announced the Baltic Security Initiative in which it granted the Baltics $169 million toward defense spending. Well, that sounds like a lot, but in the world of defense spending, which is measured in hundreds of billions, it's really not all that significant. Uh, in May of 2020, the Baltic states themselves announced an increased coordination between their respective militaries, which is nice, but again, when your militaries are a total of 22,000 people, you know, and you're facing hundreds of thousands of heavily armed Russians, how much does that matter, right? Right. 
So how does this all compare to Russia's military deployment in the region? Well, we saw earlier, again, hundreds of thousands of troops, right? But in terms of specifics, it is kind of debatable, right? Because not surprisingly, Russia isn't always transparent about like what its military is actually doing. And we'll talk about this later in more detail, but these numbers likely would be enough for Russia to very quickly overwhelm the Baltics, right? So really, as we said earlier, there's a strong argument that the recent increases are mainly symbolic. Frankly, the US spending is probably, as much as anything, an attempt to sort of undo some of the damage that was done by President Trump's repeated threats to pull out of NATO entirely, which of course would have delighted Russia, and to reassure our allies that we are behind them, but they are not gonna be game changers in terms of being able to actually defend the Baltics against hundreds of thousands of well-armed Russian troops. Uh, the Baltics and NATO, though, have signaled their solidarity in other ways. For example, at the NATO summit in July 2021, uh, President Biden held a sideline meeting with all three Baltic leaders. Uh, they confirmed the strategic importance of the Baltics to the U.S. and NATO and the U.S. understanding of rising Russian aggression. Uh, so finally, uh, what is Russia doing to signal its intentions in the Baltic states? Well, number one, as we said earlier, Russia has made it clear that its military capabilities are vastly larger, vastly outnumber and outclass those in the Baltic states, right? Number two, some analysts believe that if you look at the way that Russia has conducted military exercises in the last few years, they point to possibly a plan for seizing control of the Baltic states. This is from Bros and Raj, and I'm probably saying Raj in correctly. If, if you're a Polish speaker, please correct me. I apologize. I'm going to have to say it again, and I apologize. But this is from Braus and Rosh in uh, 2021, which, by the way, is an outstanding source. You should read it front to back. It has a lot of great information and cards. But as you can see here, what experts believe is that the Zapad 2017 military exercises, Zapad means West, I, I believe, in Russian. And so these are the, the military exercises that Russia has been doing uh, in its Western military district. And as you can see, experts have sort of interpreted how these exercises were done, and they believe that what they reflect is essentially practicing for a three-stage invasion and holding of of the Baltic states, right? So that's critically important. If that's what they're actually practicing for, that should raise the alarm, right? Now, on the other hand, as we'll see when we look at some of the con arguments, there are plenty of commentators who believe that Russia knows full well that an invasion or other attack on the Baltic states would be pointless, self-destructive, possibly even suicidal, since the presence of NATO troops there would mean automatically triggering a war with all of NATO. So the fact that Russia could win and perhaps even briefly hold uh, the Baltics would be irrelevant as it would immediately find itself like embargoed and under attack from countries that represent nearly half of the world's GDP and military power. So that is the basic story of what's going on between NATO on the one hand, the Baltics, and then Russia on the other hand. So uh, let's now move on to the part you've all been waiting for, which is some pro-arguments followed by some con-arguments. Okay, so let's do some pro-arguments. Um, I think the, the most important thing you have to start out with on pretty much any pro is some kind of argument that Russian aggression of some form, right, is, is likely in the status quo in the Baltic states. And I think first you need to establish you know, Russia has this sort of grand strategic goal of dominance in Eastern Europe and establishing a buffer zone between itself and NATO. So this is from Robert Person, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in 2020, just talking about Russia's grand strategy. It says, instead of a formal territorial empire under direct rule, Russia endeavors to establish a privileged and exclusive sphere of influence across former Soviet territory. Within its asserted sphere, Russia seeks privileged status that gives Moscow uh, a seat at the table in the capital of every post-Soviet country. It even claims the right to intervene when necessary in the domestic affairs of states within its sphere. For in Putin's view, only great powers like Russia are truly sovereign. Now, this is a nice card, right, because it gives a general explanation of what most Russia experts think is Russia's major overarching strategic objective, which is establishing an exclusive sphere of influence over the former Soviet republics, which obviously, or well, well, debatably, includes the Baltics, right? But also it explains how that goal isn't necessarily, or doesn't necessarily require Russia to actually seize or annex the territory, right? They don't necessarily need Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia to be annexed and become part of Russia. They just want them to look to Russia first, right? Like maybe Belarus does to a larger extent, right? When making foreign policy decisions. Now, admittedly, that would also be a difficult goal. As we've talked about, these are three countries that do not identify closely with Russia. But it's not as impossible, for example, as actually 
seizing and holding th these territories for the long term. So it's a little bit easier than it might seem. And in fact, there is strong circumstantial evidence that Russia does want the Baltics to think very carefully about who they ally themselves with, right? Uh, and that leads to the next point, which is that Russia is clearly signaling a ramp up toward capacity, at least the ability, to invade the Baltic states. Now on this, you can look to the Browse and Rosh piece we mentioned earlier, uh, analyzing how the Russian Zapad military exercise appears to be designed to like practice for this three-stage takeover of the Baltic states. An even better summary of that is this quote, the Russian strategic level exercises Zapad, meaning West and Russian, conducted in the Western military district on a quadrennial basis have served to rehearse Russia's war plans against NATO and against the US and Europe. Over time, these exercises have become increasingly detailed and complex. Furthermore, Russia routinely conducts short notice readiness exercises close to NATO's borders to demonstrate, test, and improve its capabilities to test NATO response. The fact that these exercises are often in violation of conventional arms control agreements is not the key point. A closer examination of Russia's recent military exercises reveals that Moscow has been preparing for a major high intensity conflict against NATO. And then you can talk about sort of the three point plan we talked about earlier. Basically, the argument is here look, when your rival, when your opponent is basically running practice session battles against forces that look suspiciously like yours, you should believe them, right? You should take the hint. When someone says in so many words through their actions, hey, I'm planning to attack you, you should probably believe them. It's also important to look not just at how much Russia is deploying in its Western military zone, and it is a lot, but also at what types of units they are deploying. If you've ever played the game, uh, the computer game Civilization, it's one of my favorites, you know that there is a big difference between seeing like an enemy's defensive units, like a pikeman or something, as opposed to a bunch of offensive units like archers and catapults. And that's kind of what Russia seems to be lining up right on the border with the Baltics. So again, citing to Bross and Raj 2021, in 2019, Russia continued to strengthen its forces in the Western Military District, or WMD, directed against NATO and Europe. This, the district now includes three army commands, five new division headquarters, and 15 new mechanized regiments. The Russian armed forces has the following units located near the Baltic states. One Guards Air Assault Division, the first of Russian airborne units to include a third manned assault regiment, and one Spetsnaz uh, Brigade, both stationed in Sokov, I think, in, uh, near Estonia. Two motorized rifle brigades, one artillery brigade, one missile brigade equipped with, and you get descriptions there of basic missiles, right? Um, note a couple of things here. Look at the kinds of units Putin is deploying here, right? They are not mainly defensive, like just infantry or missile defense or anything like that. There are things like an air assault division, a motorized rifle brigade, which is like a mechanized infantry unit designed to be transported rapidly into a region, like shock troops, right? As well as artillery to hit things from long range. This isn't just a ton of firepower, it's a ton of offensive firepower designed to deploy rapidly and to assault objectives, right? And the basic message here that I think you give to a judge is just as a matter of common sense, you don't deploy this much firepower and this type of non-defensive, primarily offensive firepower to a region if you are not realistically entertaining the possibility of aggression. And remember, Remember, and this is important, the goal of all of this deployment for Russia doesn't necessarily have to be actually winning an all-out war and holding the Baltic states forever. And that leads to the second big point that I have, which is that Russia doesn't have to actually annex or even occupy the Baltics for threatening them to be worthwhile. Instead, Russia can absolutely do major harm to NATO by just having a bunch of military units hang around the Baltics and maybe conceivably attempt some like what we would call gray zone offensives, right? Like inciting violent uprisings among ethnic Russians or maybe even making a very brief incursion over the border on some flimsy, weak pretext like sort of, you know, Adolf Hitler did at the beginning of World War II. Because these are things that can humiliate and undermine NATO even if they don't have any lasting territorial gains, which is a harm in itself. It's just something Russia wants to do in and of itself, right? A lot of the con defense on this topic is going to center around the idea that Russia knows even if it succeeds in quickly invading the Baltics, it would be too costly to hold on to them. We're going to talk about that later on the con. NATO would retaliate, the Baltics would revolt into guerrilla war, economic sanctions would cripple Russia, and so on. But there's an important pro-response to that, which is that Russia doesn't necessarily 
have to intend to take and hold the Baltic states. Rather, he can use aggression toward the Baltics to show NATO members that they can't trust NATO because the core NATO promise is an attack on one is an attack on all. So Russia may be looking for the easiest, lowest risk opportunities for a limited attack on a NATO country, which it would promptly pull back. Like even if no major response occurred, it would pull back. The goal would just be to show countries in the region and show other NATO members that they can't rely on NATO to protect them. The basic explanation for this theory comes from Fabian and others, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments in 2019. And what they basically say is Russian leadership could use rising tensions between ethnic Russian minorities and governments of one or more of the Baltic states to escalate a crisis as a means of undermining NATO unity and the credibility of collective defense. In this example, Russian leadership might ex execute a limited military incursion into NATO member territory to seize a border region with a large ethnic population to create a crisis that could divide NATO. Right? And if this happens, one of these relatively minor steps, right, it could lead to a catastrophic cascade of events. Again, from Fabian and others, you can see this card here. Essentially, what it talks about is what the consequences would be, right? If Russia believes that it can succeed with these limited activities like gray zone operations, these limited incursions, escalating domestic tensions, right? It will do this, right, solely for the purpose of undermining NATO's credibility and the U.S.'s credibility. A Russian victory would also demonstrate NATO's inability to defend its frontline states, which might incentivize both NATO member and non-member European states to tilt more toward Russia's political orbit. Moreover, although any conflict between nuclear armed states carries with it the serious risk of nuclear escalation, this risk will likely be intensified should NATO undertake a massive conventional campaign to undo what Russia has accomplished, right? And indeed, this is what the Baltic states themselves are predicting. So according to Olev Snikers, I think that's how you say it, the Jamestown Foundation in July 2021, as you can see here, leaders of the Baltic states at the July 2021 NATO conference said Russia is seeking to destabilize NATO and undermine the security of allies and partner countries. The deployment of Russia's military force as well as its conventional and nuclear capabilities threatens the Euro-Atlantic security, right? Experts envision Putin making this sort of quick assault followed by an almost immediate ceasefire rather than an all-out takeover in order to expose NATO's inability to defend its members and to divide the alliance. So the basic message is let's assume the Khan is right and Russia right now does not believe it can take and hold the Baltics through military action. Russia is still undermining NATO's credibility and authority solely by amassing these troops and these units on the border with the Baltics. Every day this goes on further undercuts their trust of NATO, not just in the Baltics, but in other member states and potential member states. It's, and, and an analogy might be important here, right? Something that could help your judge understand it. Imagine if a bully is picking on your little brother at school. And let's say the bully knows that he can't actually hit your brother because you're way bigger than the bully, right? But he still makes fun of him. He might like throw a fake punch here or there. He teases him just to psych him out, right? Well, over time, if you don't do anything, your little brother and all of his little friends are going to start wondering why you're not just like walking in and putting a stop to this. Why don't you just walk up to the bully, you know, push him up against the wall and tell him to stop, right? And that's the basic argument here, that the longer Russia can go on with these war games and massing these troops on the border and potentially threatening minor harassment of these countries, the less credibility NATO has and in the long run, the bigger advantage Russia has in terms of just like general spheres of influence. Right. Now, the next big point that I think most pros are going to need to make is that current NATO commitments are insufficient or just basically symbolic. Now, there are plenty of cards that talk about this and basically how easily Russia could seize control of the Baltics and the status quo. Uh, the big one that a lot of people cite is kind of dated. It's from Schlapak and Johnson with the Rand Corporation in 2016. And, and while it is dated, this paper is frequently cited by sort of pro you know, defense folks as the most likely of the nightmare scenarios of a Russian invasion of the Baltics. And it basically paints a picture of Russia just rolling in and taking over with very little delay or serious opposition. So as you can see here, essentially what happened here is they war gamed out multiple scenarios involving a possible invasion and the, the longest it took Russia to reach the capitals of the Baltic states was 60 hours. Basically NATO would be catastrophically defeated very quickly and then it would have to choose between just conceding and giving up which would destroy its credibility or on the other hand trying to attack which would risk a massive war and possibly nuclear conflict. Now as I said we'll probably link to a number of other sources on this but you do need to either in your case or, or in a readily available block 
be able to explain just how quick and one-sided an actual fight in the in the Baltics would be right next point for the pro is that cost is not excessive you know one argument uh, con potential con argument that you might make is the idea that the cost of deterrence is going to be tremendous and massive and there's really good arguments that this is actually not the case so this is looking back to the piece from Schlapak and Johnson in 2016. And uh, what they propose is really one of the more aggressive buildups of material and troops out there. And what they estimate is that the total cost of building up uh, defense in the Baltics by substantial amounts, like large numbers of troops, large amounts of like tanks and artillery and things like that would be about $13 billion up front and $2.7 billion per year to maintain an adequate deterrent force in the Balkans. This probably represents like the high end of estimates of just about any proposal. So like most pro teams can point to this and say, look, the absolute high end of what it would probably cost us to defend this area would be, you know, about $13 billion. And that's for an alliance with a collective D defense spending annually of a trillion dollars or a thousand billion dollars so it's by no means cost prohibitive there are other options too though for example uh, in the Flanagan piece that we talked about earlier they talk about how NATO could help the Baltics implement a sort of coordinated unconventional defense plan to do things like train and arm like a civilian National Guard coordinate intelligence pay for unmanned aerial vehicles to detect Russian incursions, clamp down on pro-Russian media and misinformation, and that this one only cost about $125 million, which I think is enough to certainly meet the threshold of being substantial under the resolution, but it's still incredibly cost-effective. So I would definitely recommend that you read the Flanagan 2019 piece. Even if you don't want to run like a specific advocacy or run a plan, it's still a good idea to understand this sort of response to like these gray zone actions by Russia. Because because these are probably the most likely ways in which Russia would, would attack and they're also the cheapest to fight back against and what that lets you do is if the Khan challenges you and says look how are you going to respond to these non-conventional Russian offensives with like misinformation or inciting you know uh, ethnic Russians and things like that or if they challenge you on cost either way you can say you know I'm so glad you asked I have a great answer for both it's right here in this planning in 2019 piece it gives us a great explanation of how we can have a really effective increase in defensive capacity in the Baltics without adding huge numbers of troops right um, so it won't provoke Russia and without spending a huge amount of money and that will be responsive to the unconventional ways in which Russia sometimes attacks so I think the Flanagan piece is a really nice thing for most pros to sort of have in their back pocket if you want to be ready to advocate for you know a specific plan or even if you don't to be able to respond to those attacks Another key pro point is that we need to act now. The wait and see approach doesn't work. Uh, it's the whole key to Russia having any chance to invade or potentially destabilize the Baltics is speed. So looking back to the Brals and Raj piece from 2021, it talks about Russia's emphasis on a rapid attack in the in the Baltics before anyone can before NATO can move in and respond. Right. So it says Russia's strategy focuses on achieving military superiority vis-a-vis -vis NATO forces, not by outnumbering or outgunning them, but by moving faster and acting more decisively than NATO is thought capable of, using surprise as well as overwhelming firepower. The overall aim is to present NATO with a fait accompli before it can effectively respond. If a crisis or conflict with NATO were to arise in the Baltic region, Russia would depend on its ability to swiftly mobilize, move, and concentrate forces. It would aim to take decisive action well before NATO could effectively respond militarily and launch high-intensity defensive operations. Around the Baltic Sea region, Russia has created further A2AD, which stands for Anti-Access and Aerial Denial Layers, through locating considerable assets in Kaliningrad and so on. So the basic idea here is that we can pretty well expect that any major Russian offensive would be built around seizing the lightly defended Baltics before NATO could mobilize. Remember the 60 hour estimate we talked about earlier and then hunkering down and making it extremely difficult for NATO to even enter due to like seizing key transportation points, long range artillery and things like that, right? So any suggestion by the Khan that NATO is just so much more powerful than Russia, it could take the Baltics back, misunderstands the problem. If Russia were to invade, their whole strategy would be to make it so that taking the Baltics back would necessarily trigger World War III. So they would be betting that they would get there, hunker down, and NATO would essentially decide to fold and lose tremendous credibility while Russia gained territory.
And then the last major pro point is that deterring Russia is key to preventing like global and or nuclear war. And obviously this is super important from an impact perspective, right? Both sides would really like to be able to link to the risk of nuclear war as their sort of terminal impact in the debate. Because hey, everybody in debate loves, you know, linking to nuclear war whenever they can. Um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. I'm just going to say that there is a great piece on this from Hal Brands with the American Enterprise Institute in 2019. And it basically just spells out a basic theory of how low-level Russian aggression in the Baltics could quickly spiral out of control into nuclear war. So in, in the piece from Brands talking about a NATO response to Russia's seizing territory in the Baltics, he writes... This sort of NATO counteroffensive is precisely the situation Russian nuclear doctrine seems mean, meant to avert. Russian officials understand that their country would lose a long war against NATO. They are particularly alarmed at the possibility of NATO using its unmatched military capabilities to conduct conventional strikes within Russian borders, so the Kremlin has signaled that it might carry out limited nuclear strikes, perhaps a demonstration strike somewhere in the Atlantic, or against NATO forces in theater, to force the alliance to make peace on Moscow's turn. A, a, a NATO-Russian war could thus go nuclear if Russia escalates to preserve the games it has won early in a conflict in the Baltics, right? It could also go nuclear in a second, if somewhat less likely way, if the U.S. and NATO initiate their own limited nuclear strikes against Russian forces to prevent Moscow from overrunning the Baltic allies in the first place. And later, Brand says that the best way to prevent this is to just make it abundantly clear to Russia that they will never take the Baltics by increasing conventional deterrence. And what he says is the third best the third and best option is to strengthen the weak conventional posture that threatens to bring nuclear options into play. The root of NATO's nuclear dilemma in the Baltics is that the forces it currently has stationed there cannot put up a credible defense. Yet, as earlier studies have noted, the U.S. and its allies could make a Russian campaign far harder and costlier with a much diminished chance of rapid success by deploying an enhanced NATO force of seven to eight brigade combat teams, some 30,000 troops. And the basic idea here is you, you just prevent nuclear war from becoming a threat in the first place by making it clear to Russian, Russia that they will never make these gains in the first place, right? And I think, honestly, at the end of the day, this is probably one of the best stories that the pro can tell. If Russia knows that it can never gain anything in the Baltics at a low cost or do it quickly through a land grab or by destabilizing the government, then the conflict never happens. The danger of escalation never exists. Russia may get mad if we put troops... Uh, into the Baltics. But Russia is not going to get so mad that it fires the first nuke and ends the world just because there are more NATO troops in the Baltics than before. Russia has watched NATO station troops all over Central and Eastern Europe in its former territory for decades, and it has never fired a nuclear weapon. On the other hand, if Russia makes a strategic mistake, if there's even a 1% chance that Russia might make a strategic mistake and think it can take, say, Vilnius or some other major city in the Baltics, with no opposition. Oh, but then NATO swoops in and tries to take it back, and then Americans and Russians are shooting at each other in a straight-up war. The chances of Russia firing the first nuke go way up, right? They become very, very real. And I think that is one of the core stories that the pro wants to be telling the judge. Just don't let this fight start in the first place, and it can't get out of hand. I think that's a pretty compelling story for the pro to tell. So with that, let's move on and talk a little bit about the con. So on the con, I think the most basic idea that, that all con teams really need to start with is the idea that Russia is aggressive, yes, but they are not irrational. They're not like some rabid animal that just attacks everything that it sees. And when they look at the Baltics rationally, their cost-benefit analysis of invading or trying any sort of incursion is really bad. It's so bad that I think there's a strong consensus of experts as you read through the literature. They repeatedly say things like, you know, uh, an incursion into the Baltics is basically a non-starter. Let's talk about the other things Russia might do, right? And there are a number of reasons why this is just such a bad deal for Russia that they would never try it in the first place. And I think you need to basically sell your judge on the idea that, again, Russia's not irrational, they're just aggressive, and they can see this is not something that they're interested in. They might they might feign interest in it, but they're not really going to attack. So the first point is that Russia's military would be devastated in a Baltic conflict. This is from Robert Farley in the National Interest in 2017. And he's just talking about how, you know, the Russian Navy would be decimated. 
Uh, its air force and air defense network would be decimated. Uh, you know, it would be just really crushed by superior firepower from NATO in a long running war, right? But more important than just the military losses is the second point, which is that aggression in the Baltics would just be disastrous for Russia as a world power. This comes from Doug Bandow of the Cato Institute in 2016, just talking about all the clear reasons for Russia not to attack the Baltics. And he says, so what would Russia gain from attacking the Baltics? You know, uh, a recalcitrant majority non-ethnic Russian population, right? So, you know, no real, uh, no real pro-Russian population to hold there. A possible temporary nationalist surge at home, likely short-lived victory over the West. The cost would be far greater, right? He talks about how there would likely be a population exodus as the already small number of folks in the Baltics pour out because they don't want to live there, which would lead to an economic collapse. So congratulations, right? Now you own a country that is falling apart economically. Good job, right? Launching a war without a convincing pretext, and there is no reason to go to war here, right? Uh, would leave the Russian public angry over the retaliation certain to come. Talking about that retaliation, you would absolutely see, for example, example, massive economic sanctions, as we said earlier, maybe even outright economic embargoes that would cripple the Russian economy. Um, it would rupture economic and political relations with the United States and Europe, probably start a losing conventional war, and even more frighteningly, possibly a nuclear conflict. And Russia knows all of these things going in. And, you know, they're as aggressive as they are, there are smart people in Russia who make rational decisions in planning their wars, right? So basically, if Russia attacked NATO allies, it would immediately become an absolute minimum the target of economic and diplomatic sanctions like basically none the world has recently seen. Not just sanctions, but possibly full-on embargoes. It would face uh, a departing population, economic collapse, uh, guerrilla uprisings in the Baltics themselves because, hey, they've done it before, losing a conventional war and risking a nuclear war. So Putin is benevolent, but he's not an idiot, right? He's already got a port, a port on the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad. So it just makes zero sense for him to bet everything, bet his you know whole future and really bet the future of Russia as a sort of second tier world power on these three small countries that don't see themselves as Russian, that don't really have any major strategic resources just to like what? What exactly? Prove that he can bring some former Soviet republics back under his wing. It just doesn't make sense, right? And that leads to the next point, which is that Russia, in fact, does not see the Baltic states as part of the so-called near abroad sphere of influence. This is from Andrew Radin of the Rand Corporation in 2017. And it basically says that Russia views the Baltics as too Western and pro-NATO to be a worthwhile target. Uh, in a recent report analyzing Russian views of the international order, we outlined Russia's core foreign policy interest, including defense of the country and regime, influence in the near abroad, Russia's term for its immediate neighborhood, and relatedly, a vision of itself as a great power. According to Russian analysts, the near abroad includes all of the republics of the former Soviet Union except the Baltic states. They see the Baltic states as foreign and fully incorporated into NATO. And he goes on and talks about how only a few fringe folks who nobody listens to even argues that they should go into the Baltics, right? Robert Hamilton of the U.S. Army War College in August 2020 echoes this, right? Lastly, there's no indication that Moscow has any intention of invading the Baltics. Russia has always seen the Baltics as different from the rest of the former Soviet Union. In short, when the Kremlin looks at Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, it sees Europe, and it has always played by different rules in Europe than its self-designated near abroad, right? In addition, as Hamilton notes, and this is just me talking here, recent history shows us that Russia sees the Baltic, Baltics differently because when Russia views an area as being like part of its sphere of influence, it says that very loudly. It tells you, hey, we think we should control this area through its words and its actions. And it hasn't done that with the Baltics. So as Hamilton writes, Russia's behavior toward the Baltic states immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union made clear the extent to which it treats them differently. As it was intervening on behalf of separatist movements in Georgia and Moldova, it scrupulously avoided escalating the situation with Russian-speaking minorities in Latvia and Estonia. So the basic idea here is that Russia has kind of given you a rubric to, to gauge which of the former Soviet republics it's likely to go after. And it's the ones that sort of share an ethnic identity, a large ethnic identity, the ones that were, were happy to be part of the Soviet Union, at least to some extent, the ones that have not always been part of, of the West. And Russia itself knows that these countries are just too aligned with the West. It would be like if the United States tried to annex, say, you know, uh, North Korea. Well, North Korea is a diehard communist country. And uh, they have no interest in the in the way of life that the United States is putting forward. That's how different, you know, Russia sees itself and and the Baltic states, right? 
Next major point is that current commitments in the region by NATO are sufficient, right? NATO has already significantly increased its defensive capabilities on its eastern front after Russia annexed the Crimea region in Ukraine in 2014. This comes from Bross and Rosh in 2021. It talks about how the NATO readiness action plan was agreed by the alliance's political leaders at the 2014 Wales summit. It was implemented thereafter. Additionally, since 2017, NATO has been implementing its enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states, which Bross and Rosh describe this way. And as you can see here, you see you know significant increases in the number of troops and overall readiness, right? So you know I think one argument that you can make as the con is that the pro has a burden of explaining to you exactly why these recent steps uh, since 2014 on the one hand and 2017 on the other hand are, uh, are inadequate, right? Why are these new steps not sufficient to deter Russia, particularly since Russia has not actually engaged in any, anything remotely resembling actual physical aggression against the Baltics? And if they can't give you an explanation, you know, sort of a common sense argument is, well, why don't we, you know, why don't we give it some time and see if these new steps that we have implemented work before we do further escalation, uh, despite them having been effective so far, right? Uh, another major point from the con is that it's more about the composition of the NATO forces that actually deters Russia and not the size of the force, right? So Robert Hamilton, again, from the U.S. Army War College, points out NATO's presence in the Baltics and Poland is the right size, large enough to present a credible deterrent to Russia, but not large enough to present an offensive military threat. NATO was right to beef up its presence in the Baltics after 2014. After all, the three tiny alliance members are simply incapable of defending themselves alone in the unlikely event of a war with Russia. But deploying seven full brigades totaling 40,000 to 50,000 troops, as some analysts suggest, would be destabilizing. Russia would doubtless perceive this deployment as an offensive threat and increase its forces in response. The four NATO battle groups currently deployed, one each to the three Baltic republics and Poland, are important for their composition as much as their size. These 5,000 plus troops could do no more than delay a Russian incursion while NATO deployed reinforcements. But the fact that 24 of the 30 NATO members contribute forces to the enhanced forward presence mission makes it clear to Russia that NATO is united in its determination to defend the Baltics and that war there means war with nearly all of NATO. So the basic idea here is kind of common sense, which is that these troops may be small in number, but what happens when Russia invades is you have to start shooting right at troops from 24 of the 30 NATO countries. And if you include Poland, that includes the United States, because the United States has a very significant contingent in Poland that almost certainly would be brought into the battle in the Baltics, right? If that is not enough to deter Russia, right, the fact that you're immediately going to go to war, right, then they are basically beyond deterrence, right? You, you would have to believe that they are so irrational that they are, as we said earlier, going to try to seize this, this territory that's not really of much strategic value at the risk of a full-on war possibly escalating to a nuclear war. If, they, if, they're, if they're that aggressive and that irrational, then you probably can't deter them anyway, right? So putting troops from these countries into these locations and making you start a war with, NATO, with 24 of 30 NATO powers, really all of NATO, should be enough to deter, right? The next point that I think is is important, uh, you know, again for most con teams, is the idea that additional commitments will provoke Russia. And this is from Andrew Raiden of uh, the Rand Corporation, and it just basically is the idea that Russia has no reason to attack uh, the Baltics, but NATO buildup may give them a reason to do so, right? And what he points to is like, remember we talked earlier about how these you know, Zapad military exercises that Russia was doing back in 2017, everybody said, oh, these things look like they're designed to sort of practice for an invasion of, of the Baltic states. Well, what he notes is they didn't, right? It simply didn't happen, right? And, and the reason it didn't happen is because Russia's foreign policy interests give it no reason to invade. But if they perceive NATO as building up sufficient forces to pose a threat, then that's when, you know, the Zapad military exercises might come into play. That's when Russia might see this area as being, you know, actually worth, you know, taking aggressive action. But even better than that is the idea that Russia's own internal military documents seem to suggest that it views U.S. aggression as the prime driver for its defense policies. And this comes from Flanagan. But what it says is that Russian strategic guidance documents consistently make clear that the United States poses a national security threat not only to Russia but also to the global order because of what the documents characterize as malevolent actions 
designed to isolate Russia or reckless interventions to promote democracy and other interests around the world with little appreciation for the consequences. Russia's 2014 military doctrine in its recitation of internal and external risks reads like an indictment of U.S. malfeasance and misguidedness. It particularly highlights the role that the United States plays in the destabilization of the situation in individual states. So the basic idea here is fairly simple, right? If Russia was going to do something, right, since the 2017 war games that allegedly showed it would invade, it would have done it by now. It simply does not see the Baltic states as strategically worthwhile. What could change that though is if NATO or the United States put tens of thousands of troops there in a way that would actually threaten Russia's interests in the short and long term. Um, next major point on the con, large-scale commitments will fracture NATO. The basic argument here is that while NATO wants to deter Russia in the Baltics, many members of NATO actually don't support putting in enough troops and material there to actually defeat Russia in an invasion. Instead, they think that the current presence of limited numbers of NATO troops is enough to keep Russia out due to the risk of starting a full-scale war with the alliance. To get enough troops into the Baltics to actually beat back Russia, the United States, at least according to these cards, would essentially have to cram that approach down the throats of countries like Germany and France who don't want to see a major ramp up, and that in turn could lead to a fracturing within NATO. So this is from Ulrich Kuhn of the Carnegie Endowment in 2018. Uh, talking about how major defense escalations in the Baltics could fracture the NATO consensus, right? And it says that first, the deterrence by denial approach would risk overstretching the delicate political consensus among NATO members about conventional deterrence and assurance. A number of member states, perhaps led by Germany and France, would not support such a policy and would seek to block it. He then goes on to talk about how even in the Baltic states, there are some, and many actually, who view this sort of maximalist approach of loading up with troops and material to deter Russia as being you know, too much and being overkill, and that in order to make this happen, the United States would essentially have to impose its will on other members. This is a very nice answer to pro-arguments that say that like a Russian incursion into the Baltics would destabilize NATO, right? That argument assumes that Russia actually invades or in some way attacks the Baltics. Uh, but you know, a major ramp up, you would argue using this card on the con, a major ramp up in, in, in defense commitments without the full consensus of members, especially France and Germany, is guaranteed to destabilize NATO. In other words, one has the possibility, the other has essentially a certainty. So that would be another argument that you could make. Um, you know, a possible sort of counter uh, proposal, it's not really a counter plan, but, but an alternative, I guess, that you could look at is the idea that NATO should instead focus on the Black Sea. This also comes from an, uh, Robert Hamilton of the U.S. Army War College. This is from August 2020, talking about how you know, NATO should focus on the Black Sea instead of the Baltics. Now, I'm not going to read this to you, but it is a very nice, succinctly written argument from a credible expert that NATO needs to focus its defensive, expert, uh, defensive efforts on a region where Russia has been objectively more aggressive, which is the Black Sea, places like Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey. And it starts with the idea, rather than fixate on the Baltics, where the threat is low and deterrent forces in place, NATO should pay more attention to the Black Sea region. It is here that Russia has already intervened militarily and is attempting to fracture the alliance and erode confidence in its commitments. The Black Sea region also serves as a hub for Russia's recent expansion into the Eastern Mediterranean and is critical to its efforts to support its intervention in Syria. And it talks about how there were four main reasons why the Black Sea region demands more attention. And it says they are, you know, that uh, Russian aggression in the Black Sea is more likely to destabilize NATO. The Black Sea is where Russia has intervened before. The alignment between Russia and Turkey is dangerous, and the Black Sea helps diversify energy sources, which makes Europe less dependent on Russian oil and gas. Now, the challenge on this argument is finding evidence that the Black Sea and the Baltics necessarily trade off, right? That you can't do both. I haven't found a card that squarely says that, but there is some evidence that historically NATO has viewed it this way. So this is a piece from Paul and Siolin, I think that's how you say it, from August in 2021. And it just says, for decades, the Black Sea has played second fiddle to the Baltic Sea in NATO's priorities. This is partly due to fears that a Russian attack on the Baltic states was more likely than conflict in the Black Sea, and also a lack of consensus from allies over the need to enhance its presence in the latter. So the argument could be, look, we don't know exactly why NATO seems to think there is a trade-off between the Baltics and the Black Sea. Maybe it's cost. Maybe it's limits on how many troops they want to deploy. Who knows? But historically, for decades, NATO has chosen 
one over the other. And there's no reason to think they're going to stop doing that now and prioritize both. So what we're saying here is the Baltics are in solid shape. There's a limited number of troops we can deploy, a limited number of money we can spend, right? The Black Sea defense situation is in really bad shape. It's a bigger target for Russia. So right now, you know, it's the time if there's going to be a ramping up, it needs to be in the Black Sea region. And, you know, if the pro doesn't see that coming, maybe as a possible, you know, third contention in the case, uh, it is something that could do a lot of damage, you know, again, if a pro is not prepared to address it. So that those are some decent arguments on the con. Now let's take a minute and talk about some final thoughts. So final thoughts. Um, I will admit that as a judge in PF and a sometimes coach in PF, I am not a big fan of the common style of sort of like blippy statistical arguments where you demand like quantifying everything. But I have to say that on the other end of the spectrum, a resolution like this where it's very, very difficult to quantify anything and you have to really rely on like whose expert is stronger and whose story is more persuasive. That can be frustrating too. But it's one of those things that for the first couple of months of 2021-22, uh, you're going to have to embrace, right? You're going to have to really be able to sell the judge on a coherent explanation of exactly what your story is. So for example, if you're on the con, you're going to have to be able to speak coherently, not just reading cards on like, look, Russia is not irrational, right? Russia is only going to act when it has something to gain and it has more to gain than it has to lose. There's very, very little to gain from an invasion of the Baltics. There is the possibility of losing absolutely everything. And, and Russia, again, you know, they're, they're, they may be called the bear, but they are not some rabid animal. They have not done it in the past. They have told you they don't view this as their sphere of influence and they're not going to do it now. The only reason they're going to invade is if we provoke them by sending in tens of thousands of troops. And you can talk all you want about how there have been these military exercises, but if these 2017 military exercises were going to lead to an invasion, it would have happened by now, right? So we've already ramped up our capacity over there. We don't need to, you know, further escalate the problem and lead toward nuclear war. When you're on the pro, the argument is similarly simple, which is essentially, look, all we're saying is, you know, Russia is never going to be provoked to nuclear war by seeing more troops, right? Or certainly not by seeing us go in and provide logistical support and, and small arms to, to civilians and things like that in these countries. It, it may get mad, it may get upset, but it will not provoke itself to nuclear war. The only way we're going to get close to nuclear war, which is the thing we should be focused on in this round, is if Russia thinks it can do this invasion at low cost, gets there, and then a conventional war breaks out. And the best way we can ensure the biggest impact in the round doesn't happen, which is nuclear war, is to make sure Russia knows right now that there is no way that that can happen. That level of storytelling, I think, is going to be very, very appealing to a lot of judges who are really going to get tired of listening to, like, reading a lot of these cards, which, frankly, I got tired of reading some of these cards doing the video. So keep that in mind, right? We say it a lot on this channel, but the ability to tell a coherent story is super important. So anyway, I hope you have a great start to the year. I hope September and October go great. Uh, we will do our best since we'll have all our people back to make sure that our videos on the November, December topics come out early. And so hopefully those will be useful for you. Uh, so I hope you have a great start to the year. And as always, we will end with what we typically end with here, which is remember debate is for everybody. So remember to work hard, have fun, and hail state.